All right. So just want to go through here and break down the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act of 2024. It is pretty complex the way they have it written. I want to just get straight to it and let you know exactly what's included and really going to take my time with each and every single section just to make sure that you understand and reduce the confusion with this because this is a lot of things going on here and I just want to make sure that you're able to follow along. So there are six parts of this tax relief for American and Families and Workers Act of 2024. Last time I checked, it still hasn't become a law yet. And they're looking to go ahead and get this finalized prior to January 29th of 2024 to make sure that they're ready to go for when the IRS is going to go ahead and collect the tax returns. So still in progress with that. We'll see how that goes. If you happen to file taxes prior to January 29th or prior to when this is passed, then you may end up having to do an amendment if you happen to qualify for some of these, or they may come up with some different strategy on how you can go ahead and get your credits that you qualify for. So like I said, I'm going to go through each of these sections. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the sections that I feel like it's going to be most applicable to most people. But again, you're going to get the overview of exactly how this goes. And the source is www.finance.senate.gov. You can feel free to look at all the details, but I'm just going to highlight the most important parts that I believe that is going to be most beneficial to you. So getting into the objective. So the proposed objective of this is to support working families, fostering American innovation and growth, increasing global competitiveness, assisting disaster impacted communities, promoting affordable housing and approve, improving tax administration to eliminate fraud. So you'll see with each and every single one of these sections, that's what they are addressing. And I'm going to go ahead and break these down now to you. All right. So First up, we have Section 1, Tax Relief for Working Families. I believe this is going to apply to the vast majority of people with families who are within a certain income threshold. So we have the Refundable Child Tax Credit calculation. I have a video, I have actually two videos that go into detail about this update here. So you can go ahead and watch that. But as it relates to this specific video here, the current law right now is the refundable credit is calculated as 15% of earned income exceeding 2,500. The change that they're looking to make with this now is the amount is going to be multiplied by the number of qualifying dependents for 2023 through 2025. So an example of that is this, a family with $50,000 of income and two children, the calculation is going to go 50,000 minus 2,500 to show you what is over and beyond 2,500 times 15% times two is how that calculation is going to be. So in this particular situation here, you can see that. So based on this particular example here, it's going to be 14,250. So again, the math is 50,000 minus 2,500. That's 47,500 times 15% of that. That would be 7,125 times the two children, 14,250. Moving on, we have the modification overall limit on the refundable child tax credit. So the current limit is 1,600 per child for 2023. The new limits is going to be 1,800, 2023, 1,900, 2024, 2,000 for 2025 with the inflation adjustments. So a family with one child eligible for 1,900 in 2024 compared to 16,000 in 2023. Going on to the adjustments of the child tax credit for inflation adjustments for 2024 and 2025 rounded to the nearest 100 is how they're going to go ahead and calculate that. So an example with 3% inflation increases the credit from 2000 to 2060. 
So getting into the child tax credit, I've been getting a lot of questions about this. So I do want to break this down and explain further who qualifies for it, just to make sure you're absolutely clear on whether you meet the qualifications or not. This is going to be from iris.gov, literally word for word. So you can go ahead and check that out if you want to get more information on that. So here we go with this. So as it relates to who qualifies for the child tax credit, you can claim the child tax credit for each qualifying child who has a social security number that is valid for employment in the United States. So to be qualifying or to be considered a qualifying child for 2023 tax year, your dependent must generally fit these criteria here, okay? And I mentioned this in the last video I shared, but I'm gonna go ahead and share it with you directly from iris.gov and you can go ahead and follow along on the screen. So the child must be under the age of 17 at the end of the year. The child must be your son, daughter, stepchild, eligible foster child, brother, sister, stepbrother, stepsister, half brother, half sister, or descendant of one of these, for example, a grandchild, niece, or nephew. So that's number one. So we have the age requirement. We have the relationship requirement. Now, the next thing we have is the financial support requirement. So provide no more than half of their own financial support during the year. So if they're able to support themselves for more than half of the year, you would not be able to qualify. So you would have had to provide that support for more than half of the year. Next, they must have lived with you for more than half of the year. So that's where they're located, the residency. So if they lived with, with you for more than half of the year, then they would meet that qualification, be properly claimed as you're dependent on your tax return. So you must claim them when you're going ahead and filing your 1040, your tax return. That is what needs to be included. Not a not file a joint return where their spouse for the tax year or file it only to claim a refund or withhold income tax or estimated tax paid. All right. And then also really important as far as the citizenship, they must have been a U.S. citizen, U.S. national, or U.S. resident alien. Okay. So you can go ahead and if you meet those qualifications and those criterias, then you, that child will be able to be considered as part of the child tax credit. So who qualifies for the child tax credit? You can qualify for the full amount, the 2023 child tax credit for each qualifying child. If you meet all the factors that I just shared and your annual income is not more than 200,000, 400,000 if you're filing a joint return. Okay, not to say that you won't get any of the credit, but it does phase out over those numbers. So once you, once your income exceeds those numbers, then you begin losing out on the benefit. So just be aware of that. Parents and guardians with higher incomes may be eligible for a partial credit, right? That's what I just shared. And if you want to see if you qualify, how much you qualify for, how much your refund is going to be, all these other questions specifically for your situation, then you're going to want to use interactive tax assistant on iris.gov. You can go ahead and use that and you will be able to get a more accurate picture of what you qualify for and how much you could potentially get in credits, but then also deductions as well. So how can you claim this child tax credit? So you can claim the child tax credit by entering your children other, other dependents on form 1040. That's going to be your U.S. individual income tax return and attaching schedule 8812 which is credits for qualifying children, other dependents. It's going to have a whole bunch of questions on there, and it's going to help you go ahead and do your calculation. So other tax credits for families, if you qualify for the child tax credit, you may also qualify for these tax credits as well. So child and dependent care credit, earned income tax credit, adoption credit, and adoption assistance programs, and education credits. You may qualify for the other dependents for a child or dependent who is not a qualifying child for the purpose of the child tax credit. It's just something to be aware of. So, and this is a little bit outside of what was in the, the act that's being passed, but I did want to share this with you to make sure you're very clear on exactly whether you can qualify for these increases in the child tax credit, because these are pretty significant. 
So moving on here, so rules for determination of earned income. So taxpayers can actually use a higher earned income of the current or previous year for 2024 and 2025. So an example of this was, and you can actually use $60,000 if you made $60,000 in 2023 instead of 40,000 from 2024 for the calculation. So why is this important? These credits are off, off at, these credits are increased with the earned income up to a certain point. So if someone in, if someone's income decreases in a particular year, they may receive a lower credit. So this is important because now that they're allowing you to be able to choose the two different tax years and you are actually able to choose the higher one, then now you have an opportunity to be able to receive an even bigger earn tax credit. Moving on to section two, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is more related, I believe, to you know larger corporations or if you happen to be in the tech industry, but they do have a deduction for research and experimental expenditures. So the current deduction over five years extended to allow current deductions up until 2026. An example of this tech company deducting $200,000 for research and development costs in 2024 in full instead of having to spread it over a longer period of time. So this extension of allowance for depreciation, amortization, or depletion. These are just tax terms that are used to talk about how you're able to write off an asset over a period of time. You have what's called EBITDA, applicable for tax years after 2023 and before 2026, okay? So that is that component there. And then moving on to this example, so manufacturing business includes depreciation and amortization until 2026. So yeah, I just want to at least share that with you. Uh, one thing that you may be interested in is they are extending the bonus depreciation. So now it's going to be back to, or they're going to continue allowed to be back to 100% of bonus depreciation. So if there's a property placed in service up until 2026, you're able to fully write off that asset. So a really popular one you may have seen or heard is when people are talking about writing off their vehicles. Now they're bringing this back to where you're able to write off 100% of that asset versus they recently reduced it down to 80%. So this is actually them extending it. And just to give you a little bit back, when it comes to these tax changes and codes, it's really geared towards incentivizing people to do different activities. So that's why they do these things. So my guess is they're doing this to basically incentivize people to go ahead and spend more money on assets for their business. So they're going to increase the limitations on expensing a business asset. They're going to increase it to 1.229 million for 2024, up from 1.16 million. Okay, so that is a that's a jump there. So small business expensing 1.29 million in equipment in 2024. Now they're able to write that off. Increasing global competitiveness. So they're creating special rules and taxes for residents of Taiwan, including reducing withholding taxes, application of permanent establishment rules, treatment of income from employment and termination of qualified residents of Taiwan. We got section four here, assistance for disaster impacted communities. So they're doing an extension for the rules of treatment of certain disaster related personal casualty losses, exclusion from gross income for compensation for losses or damages resulting from certain wildfires and special relief for Palestine disaster. So what's going on here is this. So there was some, what, what, what they're calling disasters that happened. And with, with that, the people who qualified and who experienced these disasters, what the government ended up doing was giving them checks, they gave them money, and basically provided some financial relief. So what this is allowing them to do now is allowing the people and the victims of these disasters to not have to report that as gross income. So as it relates, for example, with the 
wildfires, the definition of gross income is just income derived from whatever source. So that's generally income, and that's what's going to be taxed. So what it does is it's actually going to exclude it from gross income, any amount received by or on behalf of an individual as a qualified wildfire relief payment. It's going to be, and the definition of a qualified wildfire relief payment is any amount received by or behalf of an individual for expenses, damages, losses incurred as a result of a qualified wildfire disaster, but only to the extent of any expense, damage, or loss is not compensated by insurance or otherwise. So it's important too. So there was a check that was given to them by the government, but then also if they happen to qualify for their insurance, that's not going to be covered. Okay. So that is just something to keep in mind as well. Same thing with the other disaster here as well. Next, moving on to more affordable housing. So state housing credit ceiling increase in taxes and bond financing requirements adjustments to support more affordable housing projects. Essentially what they're doing is they're just making it easier to be able to, for, for states to be able to make it easier for them to be able to go ahead and get these affordable housing. So they're going to have easier access to housing credits. So currently a building needs a state credit allocation or to be financed with bonds to get the low income housing tax credit, the LIHTC. And that's essentially what that is. So they just want to incentivize the states to be able to provide more affordable housing here. And then section six here, the tax administration and limiting fraud. So they're going to increase the thresholds for information reporting on forms 1099, enforcement provisions with respect to COVID-related employee retention tax credit and other measures to improve tax administration and reduce fraud. So a couple of things are going on here. So the past few years, there's just been a lot of fraudulent activity going on, and it's been very expensive for the government to go ahead and try to enforce these laws, particularly with the Form 1099. What ended up happening was there's a lot of people getting paid and receiving payments through Cash App and Zelle and all these kind of under the table type of payment methods and people weren't reporting it on taxes. So what they decided to do was go ahead and create a rule to now where any business receiving more than $600 from these, these payment methods, they need to go ahead and fill out a 1099 essentially, and they must report it. So what they decided to do was it was just too expensive to go ahead and try to keep up with all of that. So now they're going to increase the limit from 600 to 1000 to be able to adjust for inflation. So there's a, a, an adjustment of an inflation. So they're going to make up for that. But then as it relates to the employee retention tax credit, what they're going to do now is they're basically going to shorten the period of when you can go ahead and file for the employee retention tax credit. And then also, too, what they're going to do is increase the penalties for people who were these quote unquote employee retention tax credit advisors. So the penalty for advisors who helped report false claims is now going to be higher. It's either $200,000, $10,000 for individuals, or 75% of the earned income from this advice, whichever is more. So again, they're really cracking down on this. They got sick and tired of people taking advantage of this. So just something to keep in mind here. But that's pretty much it as it relates to what is currently going on with this current tax law that's being proposed. Again, it's not finalized. They're going back and forth on it. I will give you an up-to-date video on here if anything else comes up. But hopefully this was a lot more helpful for you I really try to slow it down to make sure you can understand and also gave you the visuals so you can follow along as well. So again, make sure you just go ahead and subscribe, turn on your notifications to make sure you get the latest and greatest updates on this. I'm going to make sure I'm on top of this to give you the information and appreciate your time. Take care. Let me know if you have any questions as well.